Ecological economists argue that the continued pursuit of economic growth in wealthy nations is neither sustainable nor desirable. But if the goal isn't growth, then what is it? Two possible alternatives include degrowth and a steady state economy. In this lecture, I explore what a steady state economy would look like and discuss some of the changes that would be necessary to achieve it. The idea of a steady state economy dates as far back as the classical economists like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and John Stuart Mill, who believed that growth would eventually come to an end with a stationary state of capital and wealth. But unlike Smith and Ricardo, who viewed this as a rather dismal outcome, Mill viewed it much more positively. In 1848, he wrote, It is scarcely necessary to remark that a stationary condition of capital and population implies no stationary state of human improvement. There would be as much scope as ever for all kinds of mental culture and moral and social progress, as much room for improving the art of living, and much more likelihood of its being improved when minds cease to be engrossed by the art of getting on. It's very interesting to see the differentiation that Mill makes between quantitative growth and qualitative improvement. These ideas were developed further by the ecological economist Herman Daly, in particular in his 1977 book, Steady State Economics. In his more recent work, Daly argues that, following Mill, we might define a steady state economy as an economy with constant population and constant stock of capital, maintained by a low rate of throughput that is within the regenerative and assimilative capacities of the ecosystem. Alternatively, and more operationally, we might define the steady state economy in terms of a constant flow of throughput at a sustainable, i.e. low level, with population and capital stock free to adjust to whatever size can be maintained by the constant throughput. There are a few things I'd like you to notice about this definition. It's written entirely in biophysical terms. There's no mention of GDP or other socioeconomic variables for that matter. It's a strong sustainability definition which sees increasing built capital as a threat to the preservation of critical natural capital. And there are essentially two aspects of a steady state economy here, the stability of stocks and flows and the sustainability of these flows with respect to ecological limits. If resource use is above the sustainable level, then it must be reduced before a steady state economy can be established. This might happen through a process of degrowth, a topic that I explore in a separate video. Degrowth in wealthy nations would free up ecological space so that poorer nations could potentially increase their resource use and get people out of poverty. However, perpetual degrowth is no more sustainable than perpetual growth. In the end, all nations need to move towards a steady state economy. Following the basic goals of ecological economics, a steady state economy would have four characteristics. The first is sustainable scale. This means energy and material use are stabilized and kept within ecological limits. It means a stable population and a stable level of consumption. The second is fair distribution, or limits to inequality. We need to ensure that the gap between the rich and poor is not too great. And there's a strong social argument for this. The book The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett shows that societies with higher levels of income inequality also tend to have more health and social problems. The third characteristic is efficient allocation, and the allocation of resources among competing interests is the focus of much of mainstream economics, and it's something that markets are good at, at least for certain types of goods and services. And there's still a role for markets in a steady state economy, but we need to recognize where markets work and where they don't, and use markets appropriately. And finally, the last characteristic is a high quality of life. To achieve this, we need to shift our focus away from GDP towards the things that genuinely matter to people, like health, happiness, leisure time, and community. In a steady state economy, the goal is better lives, not more stuff. Can we really do this? Or is it all just some kind of hippie dream? The Canadian economist Peter Victor was the first person to really try and test this. He built a computer model of the Canadian economy to explore low growth scenarios. And since then, a number of other ecological macroeconomic models have been developed. I won't go into the technical details of Peter's model, but he's shown it's possible to have full employment, more leisure time, a balanced budget, virtually no poverty, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, all without the need for economic growth, at least in Canada. 
Okay, but how? In 2010, we held a conference in Leeds to try to answer this question. Over 250 economists, scientists, business leaders, and NGO members attended and contributed. The result was a report called Enough is Enough. We put it up on our website, and at this point, I kind of thought I was done with the project. However, the report was downloaded over 25,000 times in the first few months, translated into Spanish and French by volunteers, and featured on Italian television for some reason, which still no one understands. So Rob Dietz and I developed the ideas further into a book, also creatively called Enough is Enough, and then filmmaker Tom Bliss made it into a short documentary, which you can find on my YouTube channel. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the ideas in Enough is Enough, but I'd like to touch on seven of the changes that I think are needed to achieve a steady state economy. The first is to limit resource use. Currently, we have very few controls on the use of resources and the emission of pollutants. The Montreal Protocol, which limits the use of ozone-depleting substances, is one successful example. Because of this agreement, the ozone layer is largely expected to recover by 2050. My very first job, back in 1995, was actually for the British Columbia Ministry of the Environment implementing the Montreal Protocol, so it's nice to see that it's working. Other examples that we might list include the European Union's Emissions Trading Scheme, which limits CO2 emissions. The basic idea here is that we need more policies like this. We need to impose strict caps on the use of key resources, like fossil fuels, forests and fisheries, as well as on the emission of pollutants, like CO2. These caps should be set based on ecological criteria, using the best science available. And once we've set these caps, we can use economic instruments like cap and trade, or ecological tax reform, to stay within them. I'm not really going to say much more about this. The economic tools are there, we just need to use them. The second thing we need to do is stabilize the global population. The issue of population growth invites controversy. It's tied to difficult topics such as poverty, reproductive health, women's rights, immigration, and religious beliefs. But we're faced with a difficult reality. To live within ecological limits, not only do we need smaller footprints, we also need fewer feet. Natural increase, i.e. births minus deaths, is low in many wealthy countries, particularly in Europe, where no country currently has a total fertility rate above the 2.1 children needed to replace both parents. This should be a good thing. Break out the champagne. We've solved one of the great environmental problems of the 1970s. However, many wealthy countries are still trying to encourage population growth due to fears about what an aging population would mean for pensions and social programs. In Italy, for example, the government has started offering an 80 euro a month baby bonus to encourage mothers to have more children. This policy costs Italy around 500 million euros a year, money which might be better spent helping existing people, like refugees. To remain within planetary boundaries, we need to stabilize global population. In wealthy countries, we could largely do this by simply removing incentives to increase population. In poorer countries, our best bet is to provide education, access to birth control, and equal rights for women. These are things that would be good to do anyways, even if we weren't concerned about population growth. The third thing we need to do is limit inequality. Economic growth is often used as an excuse to avoid dealing with inequality. We're told that a rising tide lifts all boats, at least if you happen to have a boat. This little boat belongs to Roman Abramovich, the Russian billionaire. It apparently has two swimming pools, two helicopter pads, a missile defense system, and its own submarine, enough to make any James Bond villain jealous. The amount of money spent in just one year on the world's 6,000 or so super yachts would be enough to pay off the debt of all developing countries. Henry Wallach, who was a former governor of the Federal Reserve in the U.S., once said that growth is a substitute for equality of income. So long as there is growth, there is hope, and that makes large income differentials tolerable. Now hold on a second here. If growth is a substitute for equality, then greater equality is also a substitute for growth, and a much better choice for both the environment and society. In a steady-state economy, we would no longer have the excuse of growth to avoid dealing with inequality. We would need to deal with it explicitly. And one of the simplest interventions would be to have a minimum and a maximum income across society. 
By a minimum income, I don't mean some low hourly wage that's conditional on working at McDonald's. I mean a universal basic income that every citizen is entitled to, regardless of whether they're working or not. Another approach, which is also gaining popularity, is to provide universal basic services. Either way, the idea is to provide a social floor that guarantees that everyone is able to meet their basic needs. A maximum income might be more controversial, particularly if you own a super yacht with a helipad, but surely less controversial than the current situation where top CEOs earn more than 180 times the amount of the average UK worker, and where eight billionaires have as much wealth between them as the bottom half of humanity. But it wasn't always this way. The highest marginal tax rate was over 90% in the US until 1964. Currently, it's 37%. It was 83% in the UK in the 1970s and 98% on investment income. Can you imagine? Currently, it's 45%. We need to reverse this trend and move towards a more equal society. The fourth thing we need to do is to reduce working hours. And this is a personal favorite of mine, at least in theory. At present, we largely use the benefits of technological progress to produce and consume more stuff. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say I work in a factory, and it takes me eight hours to make one of these cups. One day, however, I come up with a clever idea and figure out how to make these cups twice as quickly. Does this mean I get to go home at noon? Well, no. It means I produce twice as many cups. And then our marketing department has to go out and try to convince people to buy these extra cups with witty slogans like, one cup is not enough, otherwise I'm out of a job. But we can't keep ramping up production just to keep people employed. What we can do is use the benefits of technological progress to shorten the working day, week, and year. We can have the same salaries, but more leisure time, which certainly sounds good to me. A key to making this work is to give people more freedom to choose their working hours. In France, the government tried to legislate a shorter working week, and it was hugely unpopular. In the Netherlands, however, the government simply gave employees the right to reduce their working hours. Each year, the Dutch have three weeks of additional leisure time compared to Brits and nine weeks compared to Americans. Maybe it's time to move to the Netherlands. The fifth thing we need to do is reform the monetary system. Most of our money is created not by the Bank of England or a public institution, but by commercial banks when they make loans. Now, if you don't believe me, and I admit it does sound a bit outrageous, then here it is, straight from the Bank of England. Banks do not act simply as intermediaries, lending out deposits that savers place with them. Whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. And you wonder how we ended up in a global financial crisis. This system provides a huge subsidy to the banking sector. It also means that if we want more money in the economy, then households and businesses have to go further into debt. And it creates periodic crises when people are not able to pay back this debt. So what's the alternative? One option would be to switch to a sovereign money system to prohibit banks from creating money out of thin air and to only allow a public institution such as the Bank of England to create new money. The Bank of England would decide on the amount of money to create and then transfer this money to the government to spend into the economy. In such a system, we'd still have private banks, but they'd only be allowed to loan existing money, which is how most people think the banking system works anyways. The sixth thing we need to do is change the way we measure progress. Currently, we rely on GDP, which doesn't distinguish between good and bad economic activity. The cleanup cost for the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico has been estimated at over $40 billion. According to the Wall Street Journal, the disaster boosted U.S. GDP. Although 3,000 jobs were lost during the moratorium on oil drilling, 4,000 jobs were created cleaning up the mess. We came out ahead. For a steady state economy, we need new measures of progress. We should replace GDP with two sets of accounts. Measures of human well-being, such as health, happiness, employment, and equality, these are the things we want to increase. And measures of resource use, such as material footprint and carbon footprint, these are the things we want to reduce and keep within ecological limits. It's worth saying that a steady state economy is not an economy where the goal is zero growth in GDP. It's an economy where what happens to GDP 
no longer matters. Lastly, we need to rethink the way that businesses create value. The dominant form of business today is the shareholder-owned corporation, and a key feature of the modern corporation is that it is legally bound to maximize returns for its shareholders, an interest it has to put above all others. This was famously demonstrated by Henry Ford, who ran up against the issue in 1918. Ford had declared an ambition to employ more men, to spread the benefits of the industrial system to the greatest number of people, to help them build up their lives and their homes, instead of paying increased returns to shareholders. It was a noble goal, but it didn't happen. A court order forced the company to pay the money to shareholders rather than reinvest it as Henry Ford had wanted. Today, businesses have become trapped in an overly narrow approach to value creation that emphasizes short-term profits and ignores people's real needs. Businesses need to expand their conception of value to move beyond just generating financial returns to also generate social and environmental returns. And many firms, generally referred to as social enterprises, are already doing this. Organizations like The Big Issue, Cafe Direct, and John Lewis. A steady state economy would see more social enterprises emerge. And we can help this transition by asking companies to adopt alternative legal structures that are less driven by growth, such as cooperatives and community interest companies. These structures allow businesses to prioritize social and environmental goals while still pursuing profit as a secondary motive. Will any of these changes ever happen? Well, I'm an economist, not a politician, but it's always been my hope that by showing that a steady state economy is economically possible, that it will become more politically realizable. At the moment, we're making decisions based on whether they're good for growth or good for productivity, not whether they're good for people or the planet. We've forgotten that growth is just one means to an end and not an end in itself. But once we let go of our obsession with GDP, we can focus on what really matters, the health of our societies and the ecosystems that contain them.